how living in the shadow of the cross, I can see the travesty of the misconceptions about the cross. When we say misconceptions about the cross, we mean those who have misconceptions about the cross. There should be no misconceptions about the cross because as we look at the Bible and we look at it uh, in context and putting everything into place, we find those events around the cross become very clear. There are a few misconceptions, we might say false ideas, about the cross of Christ. And I will look at just a few of these things that some have misunderstood and what some have taught incorrectly. We think about some misconceptions about the cross. We want to first think about, uh, I think about this verse in Matthew chapter 12, these verses, Matthew 12, verses 15 through 21, which will be really the key text for this lesson this evening. In Matthew 12, beginning in verse 15, the Bible says, But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew from there, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. Yet, that is the wrong text. Yes, no, that's correct. Never mind. Yet he warned them not to make him known, I'm sorry, that he might be fulfilled to spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench, till he sends forth justice to victory, and in his names Gentiles will trust. As you look at this, this section of verses here, we find what Christ would do on the cross, and we find that his actions on the cross would supply victory for the Christian. We begin first by looking at this first misconception this evening, and that is that Jesus failed. There are those who believe and teach that when Christ came to the earth, that he, quote-unquote, might, misunder- might have underestimated the rebellion and the, you might say, the wrath of the Jews. And so to establish, instead of establishing his kingdom on the earth, he instituted the church instead. The Jews some say, defeated Christ in his efforts. However, we know that Christ foretold his death and said several times in the New Testament. He also stated that his kingdom is not of this world. As we look at John 18 and verse 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. Now again, there are some who say that when Christ came to earth that he was unable to establish his kingdom and that the church is just a holding, a placeholder until the kingdom will come into existence. But notice what he says there in verse 36. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. He says, if my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I would not be delivered to the Jews. That tells us if his kingdom was of this world, there was nothing anyone else could do to change that. There was no man, no force, no group strong enough that could forcibly make Christ unable to establish his kingdom upon the earth. That's what he tells us there in verse 36. If my kingdom were of this world, but it's not. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would fight so that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not from here. If God wanted to have an earthly kingdom, he would have had one. In fact, we find several times in the gospel accounts where they wanted to take Christ and make him king by force. Instead, we find what happens is Christ slips to the crowd and disappears so so that they are unable to try to do so. Mankind has never been able to stop God from doing his will. You think about all the way back with Noah in the book of Genesis and how the world was so wicked, and how Noah and just his family of eight were the only ones who were faithful to God, and yet the wicked were what? The wicked were destroyed. They outnumbered the faithful, most definitely, but they still were destroyed. God's will was still carried out. We think about Sodom and Gomorrah, and all those cities of the plains, and how only Lot and his small family, not his wife because she died on the way out, and how they were the only ones who were able to leave Sodom and Gomorrah 
and make it out before they, that city was destroyed. That city that outnumbered the righteous yet again. But yet again, God's will was carried out. Their numbers and their force was nowhere near enough to try to even begin to stop God from carrying out His will. We think about the city of Jericho and how it built up walls around the city of Jericho. and it's, It was destined by God, it was decided by God that that city would be overtaken. And no doubt there were many within that city, but what happened? The Bible tells us the obedient, obeying God, marched around the cities for seven days. And what happened? They continued to do what God told them to do. They blew the trumpets on the seventh day. And on the seventh day, the walls fell. Well, what happened? That tells us that God's will was carried out despite any force by man. We think about in the book of Daniel with uh, Daniel and the lion's den, how Daniel was you know, put in, in prison without you know, just cause. And how he was, should have been doomed to be devoured by the lion. But the will of God prevailed. We think about the three friends there in Daniel yet again being cast in a burning fiery furnace. Yet God's will carried out yet once again. And then we get to the New Testament with Christ the Son of God being targeted from the very beginning of His birth to the time He would go to the cross all the while carrying out the will of God despite the attempts of mankind to stop it. Jesus was, did not fail in his efforts. Some say that Jesus failed because he was killed on the cross. How could he be successful? How could he be, have the victory if he died on the cross? But well, we know that Jesus dying on the cross was a plan, of, plan that God had for him as it was prophesied from Old Testament times. We look at Isaiah chapter 53. We're going to go through this very quickly. But Isaiah 53, beginning in verse 1, the Bible says, Who has believed our report? That's a reference to, to the idea of who believes us that Christ is coming. Who has believed our report? And to whom has the arm of the Lord, a reference to Christ, been revealed? He goes on to say in verse 2, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root of, at a dry ground. He has no former comeliness. And we see Him, there is no beauty that we should desire Him. He'll go through tough times. That's the idea there coming up as a tender plant, as a root of, at a dry ground. He has no outside appearance that would draw men to Him, meaning what drew men to Christ was what He said and what He taught. Verse 3 says, He is despised and rejected by men. Now wait a minute. I thought Christ wasn't supposed to know that He'd be rejected by men so strongly that He'd be placed on the cross and have to the church as a placeholder for His kingdom. Well, Isaiah knew that thousands of years, perhaps hundreds of years, rather, before Christ even was born, prophesied by the will of God, saying he is despised and rejected by men. Isaiah knew that long before Christ ever came. He says, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. That tells us what? He would come and he would endure hardship the entire time he was on the earth. Yet, supposedly, Christ underestimated the Jews. And we hid, as it were, our faces from Him. He was despised, and we did not esteem Him. Notice how many times, just in one verse from the Old Testament, prophesying about what, what happened to Christ when He came. He knew full well what was coming when He came to the earth. Verse 4, Surely He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Talking about how He would carry those things on the cross. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Christ knew he would endure hardship. Verse 5 of Isaiah 53, it says, But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are, all, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all, telling us that Christ bore the sins of all mankind. We could go on and on and on. But let's look at verse 7. He was oppressed and, afflict and he was afflicted. Did Christ knew what would happen when he came to the earth? Absolutely. Isaiah knew because God told him, and Isaiah repeated by prophecy, what would happen. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. Meaning what? He was led as an innocent man to be killed. As a sheep before it shears his silence, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Who, and who will declare his generation? For he was cut off in the land of the living, telling us he would die. 
For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with the wicked, there with the thieves, and with the rich at his death. They're talking about Joseph of Arimathea taking his body. And also him being placed in a brand new tomb, which was only done by those who were wealthy. Because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Now notice verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. Does that sound like Christ going to the cross was a failure? That it was a result of him underestimating the rebellion and the uh, outright hatred against him? No, he knew full well what was going to happen. It pleased, the Bible says, it pleased the Lord, verse 10, to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his nod, my righteous servant shall justify many, shall he, for he shall bear their iniquities. We find there what? He would go to the cross to bear the sins of all mankind. It was not because he failed. It was because it was part of God's plan for Christ. It, him going to the cross had to take place. And we read on there in verse 11 and 12 how the faithful would have their blessings from God as, and how all that is a result of Christ bearing the sins of all the transgressors and how, how, how he made intercession for them there in verse 12. This was not a failure but a part of God's will being completed. Mark chapter 8 and verse 31 and 32 says, And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things. What did Christ teach them? That he must suffer many things. That he must endure these things from the Jews and from the Sadducees and the Pharisees and so many others. And he says, and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. Christ going to the cross was something that was put in place by God long before Christ ever came to the earth. And after the three days rise again, verse 31, he spoke this word, now notice, openly. And we find that where Peter once again puts his foot in his mouth and tries to take Christ aside and rebuke him for what he was saying. Christ knew what was coming. He knew what had to be done to fulfill the will of God. John 10 and verse 17 and following says, Therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. Does that sound like Christ was overwhelmed by the Jews? No. Does it sound like he was overwhelmed by all those who despised him and he was taken to the cross by force? No, he says there in verse 17, because I lay down my life that I may take it again. And notice verse 18, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again. This command I have received from my Father. Therefore, there was a division among the Jews because of these sayings. And many of them said, He has a demon and is mad. Why do you listen to him? You notice how the Jews responded to Christ saying that he knew what was going to take place. They said, Well, he has a demon. He's crazy. Why do you listen to this man? Look at verse 21. Others said, These are not the words of one who has a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? They're saying, He doesn't sound like a man possessed. He sounds like the Son of God. We know that Christ dying on the cross would deal a crushing blow to Satan as you find also mentioned way back in Genesis 3 and verse 15 and how Christ would be the one who would crush the head of the serpent. Therefore we know the church is not a placeholder since Jesus was, was unable to start the kingdom and died on the cross. Instead Christ had all these things as part of God's will and he fulfilled God's will. We look at Matthew 16 and verse 18. He says, And also I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Since his kingdom is now this world, therefore it must be a spiritual one. And he says, I will build my church. And that tells us that all these things fall in line with God's will. It was not something that was put in place because of the rebellion of man. It was within the plan of in the design, <clears throat> in the design of God. So we think about the first misconception here. Jesus failed. No, he did not. He did the will of God. Our second misconception is that Jesus, concerning Jesus in Hades, 
Some teach that when Christ died on the cross that he went to hell because, as we're going to see here, some mistranslations and some false teaching of creeds and various things. Look at Psalm 16 and verse 10. Psalm 16 and verse 10. For you will not leave my soul in Sheol, that's hell, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Acts 2 verse 27 says the same thing. Acts 2 verse, 30, 2 verse 31 says, He foreseeing this spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in the Hades, nor did his, his flesh see corruption. Uh, chapter 13 of Acts, of Acts and verse 35, Therefore he also says in another psalm, You will not allow your Holy One to see corruption. Well, why do we talk about Jesus and Hades? Because there are those who believe and teach, and there are many writings that teach that when Christ died, he went to hell. We, in fact, we look at what's known as, uh, as we look at some ancient writings, what's known as the Apostles' Creed, states that, states, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried, and descended, and descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He descended into hell. Who is hell reserved for? The disobedient. But Christ wasn't the disobedient, was he? The book from the Apocrypha known as the Gospel of Nicodemus, as it's so called, claims that Jesus descended into hell, and that's, and that's not all, and retrieved all the Old Testament saints, including Adam, David, Habakkuk, and Isaiah. Isn't it interesting the Bible never mentions anything like that? It's no wonder that book is not included in what we know as the Bible, the canon today. None of these things have actual scriptural support. The Bible does not mention any of these things. What about the translation of the term Hades? Well, due to some translations, translating Hades as hell uh, has added also a lot of confusion. The term Hades is not always referred to Gehenna, but also we can refer to the Hadean realm. The Hadean realm is the place where the deceased await judgment. Paradise and torments are part of what we call the Hadean realm. However, Christ himself reveals where he will dwell after his death until his, until his resurrection. And so we think about where did Christ dwell? Well, the Bible tells us, in fact, Christ tells us. As you look at here in Luke chapter 23 and verse 43, when he says, Surely I say to you, when he speaks to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. And so he wasn't in torments. He was in paradise, which is part of what we know as the Hadean realm. So when we talk about Hades, we have to make sure we understand what we're talking about exactly. Gehenna refers to hell itself, a place that Christ never appeared. And so we think about these misconceptions. We can see how confusing and really how troubling they are. The idea that the Son of God would go into torments is contrary to Scripture because we know that is a place that's left for those who are disobedient. But Christ was obedient. Christ suffered many things because of his obedience. But what are some lessons for us today concerning these things? Well, there are some misconceptions as a result of man's shortcomings and misunderstandings, but they are not a result, they do not come about because of the Word of God, they do not come about because of God Himself. They come about because of man's simple misunderstandings and man's also uh, adherence to creeds as well. But we know the, that the blood of Christ was poured out not because He was defeated, but because He was victorious. We look at Matthew chapter 12, verses 15 through 21. That's exactly what's being talked about there. His blood will be shed for mankind. Look at verse 18. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will declare justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel nor cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break. And smoking flax, he will not quench, so he sends forth justice to victory. And in his name, Gentiles will, will trust. Well, that's a reference to Christ. He will bring about ultimate victory, and he has brought about ultimate victory. We have victory through the death of Christ on the cross and also through his resurrection. 
as you look at 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 57, the Bible says, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we think about this idea of Christ being defeated upon the cross. It's ridiculous. He cannot be defeated. He's the Son of God. Instead, He carries out and did carry out the will of God on the cross. Look again at verse 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory. The victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ going to the cross was the plan of God. Christ's death also leads to victory over the second death. Not only does Christ give us the victory over sin by giving us a chance to have our sins forgiven by the blood of Christ, but also gives us the victory over the second death, which is spiritual death. That is going into a place we know as the place of fire and brimstone, as the book of Revelation says, is the second death. Christ's death brings the ultimate victory. We look at 1 Corinthians 15, <clears throat> verse 54 and verse 55. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, and then, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written. Now he's talking about there in verse 54, when we leave our physical bodies and we are, we are transferring to an in, immortal body that does not decay, that is going into the heavenly home. He says in verse 54, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. What does that mean? Death, the spiritual death, loses its power in the victory that we gain in Christ. By Christ dying on the cross and dealing the death blow to Satan, we have the victory over the second death. Verse 55 says, O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? Well, there is no victory for death. There is no victory for Hades, but it's because the Christian gains the victory over all those things by putting their obedient faith in Christ and having themselves forgiven and placed into His body, which we know is the church, and thereby gain the victory through the sacrifice that Christ has made for us. Only through taking advantage of what Christ has done can bring victory home for us. In Hebrews 5 and verse 9, the Bible says, And having been perfected, He became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey Him. The author of eternal salvation. You think about that idea, the author of eternal salvation. That tells us that He is the author of all victories. We were talking about spiritual victories. He is the not just the author of our eternal salvation. You might say He is the champion of our soul, isn't He? By us putting our obedient faith in Christ and thereby taking advantage of what He has done for us, we gain the victory and He becomes our author of eternal salvation because we are one of those who, who are obeying Him. We must remember <clears throat> that victory only belongs to those who obey Him. You might add in a third misconception that everybody's going to go to heaven because what Christ has done, that is a misconception. Only those who do what has been required of us, that is obedience, get to take part in the blessing and the redemption of our sins by what Christ has done for us. Christ's death leads to victory over the second death. Christ's death leads to victory over sin. And therefore, as you think about these things, Christ was not defeated in carrying out the Father's will. You think about that very idea, how could that be possible? That Christ could be defeated. We think about all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, we also think about John chapter 1 itself. It tells us that Christ had part in creation, the creation that brought about mankind. And yet there are those who say, well, God's creation can overcome God. Well, that doesn't make any sense at all. Christ was not defeated in carrying out the Father's will. Instead, He did exactly what God sent Him to do. Christ's death did not send him to hell, but instead it sent him to paradise. And by our obedience, it will also allow us to enter paradise as well one day. We think about these misconceptions, and we could probably add a few more here. We look at the Bible, it's very clear. Christ gives us the victory. Christ gives us the hope of eternal life. 
Christ gives us the ability to miss the torments, the pain, and the, all those things that await those who go on to the second death. We get to bypass and skip all of that if we put our obedient faith in God. And that's not a misconception. That's the truth. You know, we need to replace those misconceptions with actual Bible facts and actual Bible teaching. Because when you look at the Word of God, there is no room for misconceptions. There's no room for false ideas and, uh, and traditions of men. Not unless we make them up ourselves and make up our own books like mankind has done. But when we look at the Word of God, there is no room for misconceptions. There's only room for truth and the sacrifice of Christ that brings about salvation to all those who obey Him, Hebrews 5 and verse 9. So we think about all these misconceptions today. We think about all these false ideas concerning Christ, and we go on to talk about the false ideas concerning the church and the false ideas concerning the church of Christ specifically, and the false ideas concerning all these other things. When we return to the Bible, all those things disappear. When we look at the Word of God, we find the truth in all those things. Did Christ go to Hades? No, He, he Himself said, You'll be with me today in paradise. And when He said that, He means, You'll be with me in paradise. When He died on the cross, it wasn't because the Jews overwhelmed Him. It's because He told us Himself, we saw earlier, that He would suffer, He would die, and He would rise again. He knew it was going to happen. It wasn't because anyone overwhelmed him, but because it was God's will and God's design and purpose for him. As we mentioned this morning, Christ coming to the earth, his whole purpose was to save, seek and save the lost, as he tells us there in the book of Luke. But also that was that included within that was him dying on the cross. He came to die. And that brings us the hope of heaven. So as you think about these misconceptions, these false ideas, these misunderstandings, they do not bring hope. What hope and what encouragement do we find the idea that Christ could come and be overwhelmed by the Jews? That doesn't give us much hope, does it? The idea that Christ, when He came and died on the cross, He went to hell, that doesn't give us much encouragement. And we can realize there's much more encouragement in the truth of the matter. Christ, being the Son of God, cannot be defeated. Christ, being the Son of God, cannot go to a place He's not destined to go because He is the author of our eternal salvation. So as you think about these things, it seems let us be very clear that there is no room for false ideas as we open up the Word of God. There's only room for truth that brings about salvation. The Bible tells us how, or what we must do, rather, in order to have heaven as our home. And we know there's misconceptions about that very same idea. But the Bible reveals we must hear the Word of God, as we find there in Romans 10, verse 15 and 17. The Bible also tells us in Matthew 16 and verse 16 that we must believe, or rather Mark 16 and verse 16, that we must believe that Christ is the Son of God. It also tells us that we must repent of our sins, we find there in Acts 2 and verse 38. The Bible also tells us we must be willing to confess that Christ is the Son of God, not being ashamed of doing so, but being proud and excited to do so. And then we must be baptized, as we find there in Romans 6, verses 3 and 4. And then we must live faithfully, Revelation 2 and verse 10. You know, there's a lot of misconceptions about all of those things. But when we open up the Word of God and allow it to be our God, all those things fade away. And we find the truth of the matter, and we find out how we truly can have heaven as our home. We also know that as Christians, sometimes we make mistakes, but we can repent of our sins, confess those things to God, as you find there in James 5 and verse 16, and we can again be made right and pleasing in the sight of God. This evening, we can help you anyway, and come forward now. Ask together we stand and sing the song that's been selected.